Hello, welcome to feedback episode number 11. My name is Ian Antonio, percussionist in Yarn Wire, and today we are very fortunate to be joined by the scholar Judy Lockhead, who will be talking with us along with composers Margaret Shadell and Matthew Barnson about the Yarn Wire International Institute. Uh, just a reminder to those of you checking in today, you can always send questions ahead of time to feedback at yarnwire.org or join the live chat on YouTube to submit questions in real time. All right, uh, we are super excited that you're here today and I'll just hand it off to Judy. Thank you, Ian. It's a pleasure to be here and to participate in this reinvention of how we exist as musicians in the world <laughs> nowadays. Um, and it's a it's fun to, it's been an interesting opportunity to go back and think about the Institute and how it started and what the goals were for the Institute. Um, and so I did a little research today, uh, which means going back in old emails and finding out what kind of things were done. And the, the first email I got um, from Ian and Russell was in November of 2014. Um, and I had actually been working with the group a little bit in preparation for their performance at BAM with, um, mm -hmm. you know, Sushan Stevens, uh, that, yep. that event. And so it was kind of fun to think about this at the same time. And so Ian and Russell came to me with the idea of starting an institute at Stony Brook. Um, we'd had a few summer music things at Stony Brook in the, in the past. And I said, this would be great. And I think we should do it. And so then we embarked on the process of getting it going. And the concept was, was yarn wires and Stony Brook was just gonna be the place where it was going to happen. We happened to have a big basement room with lots of instruments in it and lots of rehearsal space and basically an underused facility in the summertime. So it became a really interesting idea. And then we embarked on a few uh, meetings with our then chair Perry Goldstein and, and Eduardo Leandro, the, the percussionist who needed to bless the use of the space. <laughs> um, For instance, and, sage. But, <laughs> yeah. and then, yeah. yeah, and then we had to get use, um, permission to use the, the stage during the summer. And so there was a bunch of things. And, and then we talked about a lot of important things like if we have students coming in, how how much is the food going to cost? And where are they going <laughs> to stay? And you know, all these important things that, that are essential to having a successful um, festival. Um, and as everybody knows, the, the social time that's spent around food is a very important part of these interactions. That's true. Um, but one of the primary things that, that, that Ian and Russell came um, to me with was the idea of having a kind of festival where there'd be a lot of collaborative work where where students and composers and performers would work together to create music in all of its senses and it was that idea of the collaborative uh, work and this idea of some kind of distributed creativity that I think was a really compelling thing of that project and so I thought maybe we could just start with that and maybe um, the my colleagues here and you know, my composition colleagues at Stony Brook who were have been part of the, the festival for a number of years and contributed to it. Maybe you can talk about why you think this kind of collaborative work is so essential and what is what are its you know most successful parts and maybe perhaps what are some of the the things that haven't worked so well over the time. So maybe I'll just toss that off first to Ian and Russell, since you came yeah. to me, I'm obviously you were working with the rest of the group at the time, but yeah. um, you were the you were the envoys who came and pitched it. So yeah, you want to go in or no, no, go ahead. I mean, I I think that the for me it was like it's like what you said, Judy. It's this collaborative uh, process, and we, you know, around that time. 2015, there were a lot of music festivals. Um, everyone was doing it, you know? Um, so we weren't really unique in that regard, you know? I mean, there's so many great ones that students have to choose from. Uh, there's the So Percussion Institute. Um, there was Chosen Veil at that time. I don't think the Eighth Blackbird one had started yet, or maybe it was starting at the same time. 
Um, but a lot of ensembles were doing this. And, um, you know, our reason for doing it, which, um, you know, I'm not sure if the other groups have the same uh, reason, but our reason was to kind of explore the way that we, we had been making music. And um, it, we thought it would be valuable for students who weren't at a place like Stony Brook, who hadn't gone somewhere like that um, with such a collaborative atmosphere, that they could kind of work in a similar way, you know? And, and I remember that when I was a student, going to festivals was so important for me, for meeting people, making new friends, that it felt like it would be cool to kind of lead the charge in making a, a festival that I would want to go to, you know? Um, and I think that's kind of where we came up with the idea. Ian, if you have... No, that, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah. So, um, Russell, you mentioned that, that you felt that there's a lot of collaborative work going on at Stony Brook, uh, where you all got your degree from. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering what you think, uh, how that model is different from other things that might be out there for for musicians and why, how you thought about transferring that into this kind of context mm -hmm. um, with with music making. I'm, I'm not gonna name names of festivals, but there are some ones <laughs> that I have attended that stuck really uh, strongly in my mind where a relationship between performers and composers um, was, let's say, less than positive and um, and that that struck me, you know, as as a not helpful way of making music for myself. It's not the way I, I want to see making music. Um, and I don't know if this is answering the question, but it you know I saw that model, kind of a top down model where the composer gives the sheet of paper, or maybe two sheets of paper, <laughs> you know, <laughs> full score, um, and, and the performer has to you know. Uh, realize it as one kind of way of, of working and around 2015 we were starting to see increasingly that the way we were working with composers because we were having to generate um, material was on a more hands-on way you know and and it was really fulfilling artistically uh, we I think each of us developed our own voice um, in how to work with composers and we became more co-creators I would say than um, simply you know reading off like a library score or something and and i think that's i see it a lot in music in new music today um it we all take it for granted i think um and it's it's not really new or anything but it's something that i i think we wanted to emphasize as a way of working yeah and i would just quickly add to that also that i think maybe partially also in what you were asking, Judy, um, is this idea that, you know, when we were all students at Stony Brook, I think we were really shaped by the sort of open um, community-based uh, philosophy of making music that exists in in our department there. And I think, you know, I, for personally speaking from my own experience, I, I really only remember working with student composers at Stony Brook in a very open, collaborative way where there is dialogue about what works, what's possible, what's not possible, how to fix things if they weren't working. And I think that really informed the ways that I thought about how new music could be made in general, you know, um, along with, you know, getting a finished score and, and doing what's written on the page. But I think, yeah, definitely we were heavily influenced by that spirit of openness that um, has really always existed in the Stony Brook Music Department. And I think, you know, we, we had learned some skills that, you know, we had seen younger musicians were asking us, you know, even real basic things like, oh, do you, how, do you, how do you put on a concert? You know, things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. where, do you do, where do you do that outside of school? And so there, we saw there was a kind of gap in either knowledge or people that people could ask, you know, that students could ask. And, and I thought this was a nice place that younger musicians, composers could ask whatever they wanted, you know. And we got some real personal questions along the way, you know, that seemed basic. But um, when we had a real kind of uh, open atmosphere, people really opened up. And, and I, th I thought that was really uh, useful for everyone. So the, the s several day 
structure of a festival like this, which allows people to have that kind of very personal interaction in the midst of creating works that will then be performed, is allows for that kind of exchange to happen, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and I think thinking of it all as some sort of collaborative effort rather than a, you know putting people into I do this, you do that kind of thing is is very important. And one of the things I've really been um, impressed with with the, with especially the students who come is how many of them are also performers, right? So they're actively creating and participating in them. So maybe it's good to get our two composers to uh, to say something about their experiences with the Institute and how uh, this model of collaboration has worked from your perspective and what kind of things you think it, it uh, encourages for both performers and and performers. Did I say that? Composers and performers. Mm -hmm. You want to start, Matt? Sure. I mean, one of the things I think, so I, I participated in the first year, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Inaugural. Uh, and one of the, I was, I was thinking about this, uh, you know, when I remembered that, that we were doing this, that one of the things that this institute did or one of the things that it caused me to start noticing which i've noticed more and more is that there's a younger generation of composers than me that are interested in actually very different things in this way that i think actually represents a shift in how we are starting to think about music within this field of classical music and it's precisely what you're saying in terms of one that is more collaborative one of the things I thought a lot about, uh, I, I saw it first in the Institute, but then I've seen it as well with the applicants we get at Stony Brook, for instance. Um, I think how we think about virtuosity and collaboration. I think if you looked at a generation or a generation older than, than mine, uh, there was still kind of Carter and Fernie Ho haunting the, the new music world and, and, and thereafter. Something I don't think you see anymore as a, a virtue, certainly among my students, but certainly even in the students beginning uh, at the Institute. And, and I think part of it comes from this idea of the composing performer who's very conscious of whatever their talents and or limitations are suddenly. And with that idea of one that is a give and take of collaboration, um, which is, I think, which is, I think, very, very interesting. I think, I think it does represent a shift right now in how people are composing hmm. music. And I think I first saw that at the Institute as somebody who is much more a top-down composer, which is, mm -hmm. I, I just want to deal with scores and uh, I want to I make sure I can, I know how all the instruments work, but at a certain part, my process doesn't, isn't, isn't about a lot of give and take, but I see in my students that it is much more. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting, yeah. Meg, do you want to? Yeah. Um, Add some comments to that? Yeah, I would say I am of the the later generation, but I'm earlier than Matt, but I <laughs> definitely came out of a performance background and came to composition a little bit later. And one of my favorite things is to work really closely with um, with performers. And that has caused me a bit of heartache in my life as people have been like, well, what did you compose and what did the performer bring to it? Um, and something I love about Stony Brook is that that is encouraged. Um, and something that's really exciting um, is that then performers can explore composition at this institute and some of the composers were able to perform, um, some of the good pianists. And I think that just strengthens both sides when that's able to happen and that's been really lovely. So rather than thinking of composer and performer as these separate poles, mm -hmm. there is indeed a spectrum. Um, and I would, Rob is over <laughs> in, in Queens as well and he's a percussion student but he's been writing music recently. And 
um, it's been really cool to see that side of things, particularly people I think who improvise well, then think, oh, how can I structure this into something that could be seen more as a composition rather than some real time tidbit in someone else's piece. Just uh, to fill everyone in, uh, Rob, <laughs> he's laughing right now. Rob is running our, uh, our stream right now at the Yarnwire computer. Um, if anyone out there wants to say hey, just uh, <laughs> drop him a line. Shout out to Rob. <laughs> Shout out to Rob. Yeah, we couldn't do this without him. <laughs> I, I wonder if if the the group of you could also comment on how the student performers and composers who come to this institute how they. Um, I mean, why are they interested in this? Are they expecting something different when they come? Are they surprised by what they're going to get, what they do get, and and how does it change their perspective on being a um, a musician in the twenty first century? Yeah, um, it's see, it, my initial impression was always like the composers that apply apply because they're hoping to get some good documentation of a piece they wrote to use later in their life somehow. <laughs> and the performers are coming to play <clears throat> the works of a master, you know, like a, a pre-existing piece, um, a, like a famous piece of music and get coached on that and perform it. But I, my impression is that once um, all the participants are there, they realize that the kind of give and take in this collaborative process becomes the primary activity at the Institute. And I think it's the development, rehearsal, and realization of the composer's pieces that becomes the kind of core activity. Mm -hmm. And it's that kind of soft area of learning that's when the piece is done and engraved, but the parts haven't yet taken a solid shape and over the course of the rehearsal process that they see they see the piece coming into focus, both performer and composer. Um, mm -hmm. I think that kind of changes their their approach to the institute. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I was. And, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say also, you know, when we were starting out, and especially in the first couple of summers before we really had a reputation uh, or much, you know, I think word of mouth a lot of times is for better. Or or for worse, one way that that students know about different summer festivals and, you know, their friends say, hey, I went to this one. It was really awesome. You should check it out. Um, but when we were sort of recruiting, um, because that is what actually happens is, is when you're starting out, you do have to do a lot of recruiting. When we would reach out to our colleagues who have jobs teaching around the country or internationally, I think for me, at least, I, one thing I always asked was, you know, if you have students who are curious, who are open and interested in lots of things, um, that's the type of student we want. It's okay if they don't have a ton of new music experience yet, but what we're looking for is someone who is has an open mind and is excited to learn something new. I think that's also the type of student that we've tended to attract. Also, even after maybe we started to get a little more word of mouth advertising, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Meg, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You want no, to No, no, no. It's hard to over yeah, yeah. zoom. Um, something I think is really great is it's it's a very flat structure. So there isn't like yarn wire and the professors are up here. It mm -hmm. um during the rehearsals and the coachings especially it was everybody's working together to explore and figure out what the best way to make the sounds are um made and it was it was really special um mm -hmm. and i think that the students felt that um and you get a better result because people aren't afraid you know, people mm -hmm. were just throwing ideas out there it was very very positive and even if you thought something wouldn't work you tried it <laughs> and <laughs> i thought that was a really it, it helped them learn so much to 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 give that space mm -hmm. yeah. see that picture right there that's a composer adam but I don't know what he's doing. He's playing tambourine. I think it's a tambourine. That was during a big but, group improv. The students oh, organized amongst themselves. Yeah. yeah, that was cool. It was gotcha. really, really <laughs> amazing. Um, 
Along this line, we actually, I think we have a question right. from one of our viewers, and it sort of ties in a little bit to what we were just talking about. Um, so let's, maybe we can take that question. This comes from Danielle, who asks, how are you meeting the moment with Black Lives Matter and the applicants to the Institute? Uh, how was 2020 different, and how might 2021 be even more different? Um, so that's a really great question. It's something actually we've been talking a lot mm -hmm. internally as a group yeah, about even, like for the whole, even, the whole time. yeah, for this whole summer. And I think, you know, like we were saying when we were starting out, just getting any students at all was sort of that first hurdle. And I think as we've been growing, we've been talking a lot, um, not just for the Institute, but I think in general as a group, how we can better address equity because classical music is a very white institution historically and, and in many ways presently. And even though new music in some ways sits outside of that, it's still part of that history and tradition. Um, and I think education is a huge part of maintaining that sort of um, stranglehold in some ways over the classical music institution. And I think the Institute could be a great tool for that. Um, and it's complex because it's not just about recruiting more students from different places, but it's also about what we do as a group and how we make it clear that we want to be part of the solution, what our philosophies are about representation and making music. And I think that's something we've, we've tried to do and definitely need to do more as we move forward is, is choosing composers who represent a wide variety of backgrounds, viewpoints, stylistic uh, sensibilities. Um, and I think, yeah, we, it's something we have a lot of work to do on and, and we are working on in a lot of ways. It's not a super specific answer because we haven't we haven't figured it out yet, but we're working on it, definitely. But Russell, maybe yeah. you can well, add a little bit to that. I mean, I, I, everything is exactly what I was thinking. I mean, we were trying to attack um, some of these issues in terms of recruitment um, and making sure, you know, there's a good balance between, you know, performers and composers of different backgrounds who attend. Um, and also, you know, when we program the music, on in the institute, we're looking at what repertoire we have um, that could, uh, you know, fill some gaps, and that's been really enlightening for us to see where we need to do more work. Um, and so, you know, in order for us to do the institute, we also need to reflect these ideals that we have and these goals. Um, we're trying to attack some of these things uh, from an economic angle, also, um, because in addition to, um, and these are separate issues, I understand, but um, you know, we're trying to make it as cheap as possible <laughs> as well so that people can attend. These things are, you know, it's expensive for us to put it on, but really I would love for it to be free because you know, then that, you know, that lowers a barrier of entry. We've already made the application fees non-existent you know for these very reasons we don't want there to be any barriers and we want to try to have as many different people able to come because i mean that's what to me at least new music should be it should represent you know lots of different viewpoints um to that end you know um when we are inviting guest uh artists because in addition to our faculty we have guest artists who come and give master classes and and talks we are really attuned to that now in trying to find people outside of our genre, outside of, um, you know, our our practice, as it were, um, to get as many different voices in there as possible. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a lot, we have a lot more to do. Yeah, we're, we're working for we're sure, working and it. we still have a long way to go, yeah. but yeah. Shout out to those directors of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation who are listening right now. <laughs> Indeed. Certainly <laughs> accept any donation to lower the tuition costs. Yes, we, we, yes, we've actually had right. incredible support, foundation yeah. support from the Augustine Foundation and that's true. in kind support from the Stony Brook Music Department. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, lowering the barrier of entry is certainly a, a key, key yes. to this effort. So there, uh, maybe I can just say something about this a little bit and address sort of the complexity of the problem. 
Um, so a number, like three years ago, Andrew Norman won the Graumeyer Prize, and he was infamously quoted as saying what, about the issue of, of lack of representation of people of color and, and of women who had won the Graumeyer Prize. He said, well, you know, with new music, we can solve that problem. And so, yeah, and then I got a lot of people kind of excited, you know, for various reasons, like, what do you mean? You know, here, here's this white guy who accepted the prize and, you know, maybe you should have turned down the prize and, and, and offered the money to somebody else and so forth. But anyway, it did prompt some discussion um, amongst people that, that I hang out with, the, the um, music studies people. And, um, what you know, it's it's not a simple problem to try and address the the lack of, of diversity in our our field of classical music, and some of it has to do with the definitions of what is classical music, mm -hmm. and how it's pitted against other genres. Um, but it also has to do with the corporate structures or foundation structures that give prizes, the people mm -hmm. who give prizes, and the nature of music education, and how people are channeled into certain kinds of of music making. So it's it's not at all a simple problem. It's not gonna have a easy solution. It's just gonna have to have a lot of people who are devoted to the project to try and to, to diversify in a variety of ways. And you know, one way you can do that, of course, is to to make sure you're inviting diverse voices to be mm -hmm. part of your music making and that you go out and attempt to try and find uh, music to perform that that can further that kind of diversity so it, it's a very difficult problem mm -hmm. but one that needs to be solved uh, and it's going to require uh, people at all levels of music making mm -hmm. to to try to address this so if, could i uh, i'll add one more thing because i remember in danielle's question was it danielle yeah yeah mm -hmm. in danielle's question um specifically related to the institute you know this this last summer's institute was online because of the pandemic but we did specifically um have a, a roundtable discussion on this uh on this topic you know it when the protests were happening um we were like well you know we really need to meet this head on it's on everybody's mind mm -hmm. and so we invited uh, lauren kajikawa to give um a little talk on his paper um you know, as a as an entry point for for students to to discuss this stuff, and it was really amazing, so amazing that actually we had to kind of come back and add another session later on mm -hmm. where we could um, continue these discussions. So, as far as the institute goes, it's my hope that you know no topic is off limits. In fact, it should be just right out in the open. And these are this the institute is a place where we can work on um, and discuss. Actually, it's less working on it and it's more discussing and, and listening um, on how to address some of these issues. And we got an inkling of that this summer. And I think in future summers, we're definitely going to keep doing it. I have a quick question, actually, for <clears throat> for Meg and Matt ab about issues at the Institute. Um, I found that in my speaking with, um, and maybe Russell and Laura, you might be able to reflect on this also, but in speaking with participants, um, somehow like, even though the program is happening at a, at Stony Brook at an institutional facility, it's kind of extra institutional. It's outside of the institute a little bit. Um, hmm. So I'm, I'm using the word institute and institutional way too many times. It's outside of um, a kind of official academic setting and I find that I'm able to sh maybe share more um, kind of like off the record comments with the participants in a way that I probably wouldn't share while giving a master class at another university um, and I'm wondering if maybe Meg and Matt in kind of more casual conversations with composers if if those kind of um, off the record interactions are more common at a, at a festival like this for, for me, no. Okay. I, I, I just, I, I try to keep things as much as I can. Um, I mean, I, I think I, you know, what's, what's off the record for me? You know, I pretty much speak my mind on all manner of topics. <laughs> uh, 
but to try to do it in a way that's that's professional and respectful. So so in as much as I mean that I'm yeah. I'm 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 forthright with people. That's always going to happen in the way that I try to be professional and respectful. I, that's that's always going to be the habit. Yeah. Uh, in the way that I can occasionally lapse into gossipy uh, shadiness, that's probably also going to happen. But I don't think that's any different from. Uh, my institutional profile, <laughs> okay. to my non-institutional profile. I think there's a, a camaraderie that develops because of the the time frame. So maybe there it, it something happens there that wouldn't happen in a master class at a that's just a one or two day event, or um, even at Stony Brook where you see the students once a week, seeing them every day. Um, you, mm -hmm. you just get a, a feeling for the, the variations of life a little bit more. Cool. But I also think, you know, the, the funny thing about music festivals, and I think back to all the ones I've attended, but also the ones I have taught at, it's always such a strange moment because because everybody gathers and they hardly know each other. And there's this moment where as composers, you are sharing. And in the first couple of days, there's a kind of competitiveness and pride. And I think as a, as a teacher, you have to be very careful at that kind of moment, not to put anybody on the spot. Uh, and then it develops later into something that, that is more, because there's more time to share. There's more time to share outside of the faculties, uh, watchful eyes or, or you're not there to impress the, the, the faculty or your other uh, classmates. And, and I think back at my time of attending any festivals, those are chances where you get to meet people that are going to be with you your entire careers. Mm -hmm. I think back to people I know from June and Buffalo that uh, are my are still my peers to this very to this yeah. very day and this is what I tell students at these types of festivals that the relationships you're making here, uh, and this is why you also, I think, have to be, you have to to imitate a kind of respectfulness and camaraderie because these are relationships that if you go into the field are going to be with you for for forever. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I guess that's, that's part of it too. So yeah, I think it does happen. I'm not sure it happens because of the faculty or not. I think, mm. I think it's because everybody's together for a long time. Yeah, yeah. To add to what Meg said, I think Meg's totally right on that. Yeah. So maybe you, uh, I was told people I'd invite them to give their sense of the highlights of any particular festival or the low light of any particular festival. And, <laughs> and uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll do that, but I'll start by saying that I, get, I think it was in 2019, there, uh, there's a performance of of this Lang piece, mm -hmm. Lang, right? Um, and and the lights went out on campus, which never happens. <laughs> there was a power <laughs> failure because there's supposed to, the university is supposed to have this very you know reliable uh, self-sending power source, and then something happened and all the lights went out. But the the recital hall had emergency lighting, and so it stayed on. And so we were kind of sitting in the darkness with with this emergency lighting for this piece. It was really a magical moment, but but at the same time, it was this kind of catastrophic thing that was happening. Um, so that was kind of fun. So maybe we go around and you could just say things that that were uh, highlights or lowlights or a mixture of the two. You want to start, Ian? Sure. Yeah, I think it, one of my highlights was I think in the very first first the inaugural year um you know the last concert was always a kind of like giant logistical hurdle um getting all the gear down there and, and everybody had been preparing for a long time and then i i think it was maybe two of our percussionists um mika and, and miriam they for some like um odd odd reason of scheduling they didn't play on the maybe the second half of the last concert and they had decided to decorate the orchestra room um, in like this like party like a not a kid's birthday party but they had tons of balloons <laughs> and streamers and so when we all came back from the last concert we like were welcomed by this like giant festive orchestra room where we'd been rehearsing all week so and we've never all of us at Stony Brook had never ever seen that room <laughs> so festively attired you're like this it's has true. possibility yeah <laughs> it's true. 
so that funny. image sticks in my head. Yeah. Did you guys do karaoke that year, or was that no, only that no? Was that, next. that was the next yeah. year. Took it to another yes. level. <laughs> Russell's rendition of um, <laughs> the Little Mermaid. You know, I tried. I tried this summer <laughs> online. Uh, and no one, no one did it. Zoom karaoke is very difficult it to pull very, off. Uh, yeah, yeah. That was very vulnerable. So Matt, do you have a memorable moment? Uh, I, I think that I think the memorable moment was just to get to it was what I said earlier. It was it was to get to see where a shift in a younger generation of composers was happening, something that I could actually now looking back uh, can 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 place as kind of a moment where it, it, it felt like things were different. That was that was really interesting. It was really interesting to get to see so many young composers share their work and uh, kind of respond to them. I think a low light was uh, I was in summer. I was in summer mode and <laughs> was wearing my cutoff jean shorts around campus and the dean at the time walked by and definitely like raised an eyebrow that i could tell <laughs> <laughs> amazing what about you meg um i'm gonna this is gonna be gross a little bit to make a plug for stony brook university composition program but um one thing that happened um is by teaching there and, and getting to know the students when they apply to Stony Brook, we can like actually advocate for them in a different kind of way. And we've had some some wonderful students come through the Institute and then come to Stony Brook and be really successful. Um, and it just, it's a proving ground and um, been really grateful for that. So thanks, Yarn Wire. Yeah, yeah, that's so it's, awesome. It's the obstacle course that they have to run <laughs> <laughs> Have to you can out find how your to way to through the, the basement. Right. Yeah. How to get to the recital hall. <laughs> right. that's, a, that's a trick, right? I still haven't figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> you got you to gotta live there for a few more years. Yeah. 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 Right. What about you, um, Russell? Um, I think, you know, it's in the first year where I heard students play some of the pieces that we had commissioned for the first time. You know, because that music has lived in the ensemble for so long. And then to hear, you know, students perform some of those pieces was just like, it was kind of an aha moment. It was like, mm -hmm. oh, this is great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I've been hitting that one note wrong every time. No. <laughs> hey. No, I, I mean. <laughs> sorry. That did yeah. happen. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know. I thought it was an octave. No. <laughs> No, but you know, it gives you new insight on the stuff and, and lets you hear it from the outside and also see what it takes for students to learn it. And that, that was really special, you know, and that's yeah, kind of been yeah. a, a major part of the, the Institute. Yeah, that's good. Russell stole yeah. mine. <laughs> mine <now. laughs> no, well, no, you no. have to have a wrong note. <laughs> you have to come up with a new one. Laura. No, I actually, well, because I, I was thinking of something along that lines, but I can, I can also say another huge highlight was I think the second year in 2017, um, I think it was that year we started, uh, we instituted this new part of the program, which was a, a collaborations project where in addition to, you know, composers submitting a, a work or a proposal for a work that they were planning on, on writing for the Institute and having performers uh, rehearse um, and perform, we also asked people to pair up uh, in any group of their choosing any size from duo to full institute uh, collaborations. And I've seen some really, we had a couple of really amazing ones. I remember, I think that it was maybe that first year, mm. uh, one of our participants uh, wrote a piece for balloons uh, where everybody has a balloon and there's like a strip of paper and you draw, you know, your instructions and then there's a projection on the wall. Um, and I think we, it was incredibly fun and incredibly effective. And, and then I think we used that for an icebreaker the following year. Mm -hmm. And then last, our last in-person institute in 2019, we had an all participant collective group improv that was a total surprise to all of the faculty uh, and mm -hmm. was raucous and amazing and hilarious and i don't know it just i think the the spirit of just 
let's experiment. Let's see what we can come up with um, when we're left to our own devices, when performers are encouraged to come up with ideas or composers are encouraged to try out performing in some way. I think that's a really beneficial experience for everyone to try to wear someone else's hat for a while, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. So other thoughts, things you wanted to talk about? I think we did have one other question Whoa. that came in. Um, oh, okay. Let me just, let me pull it up here. Uh, we may not have a, a screenshot. Oh, we do oh, have a Rob screenshot for it. it. Rob, Rob is on it. Uh, do you ever have applicants who write music or play music uh, from non-Western traditions that intersect with classical new music in some way? Which is a super great question. Um, and I'm thinking about we that. Haven't, we haven't. We've had, we've had we have had some Shako Hachi playing. That is true. Yeah, oh, yeah, we we have a participant who a two time participant, amazing uh, performer composer named Wells Ling, who also does a lot of um, he participates in a lot of uh, taiko drumming mm -hmm. groups and plays Japanese music and Japanese instruments, um, and he has done some collaborated one of his collaborations projects involved that. But I think actually that's a very good point that notational practices in classical music actually are one uh, sort of exclusionary thing that come when, since we were talking about that earlier. Uh, and you know, as Yarn Wire, we have definitely worked with composers who don't come from classical music backgrounds, who don't notate music in traditional ways. And I think if we can find a way to incorporate mm -hmm. Um, and open up our institute to music makers and composers uh, who may not even label themselves as composers, but who are clearly composing and creating music. Um, I think that is actually another really, really important area um, that new music can address, is yeah, what is the role of notation? I think maybe we should just put it on the application. Yeah. <laughs> just like, yeah. You know, notational yeah. history well. like and, and practice. It shouldn't be a barrier for yeah. entry for for applying. You know, it's something I'm personally interested in. I think we're all interested in um, in exploring, you know, all those intersections. There's a lot. Remember, of though, too, that that there, there's this I don't know if you've any of you have gotten the new uh, Pierre Boulez book with the Collège de France lectures. And he goes in, and it, it's an important reminder, I think, especially of the yarn wire setup, right, which is that around the beginning of the 20th century is when all of these percussion instruments come into being and the question, not into being, of course, I'm saying it wrong, right, that's my right. Eurocentric saying it, but come into the Western, uh, the Western uh, uh, orchestras. And the question was, how do you notate this? <laughs> And to what specificity are you notating this? I mean, he, he's really quite eloquent about it in these in these essays. But of course, the whole Bartok sonata setup is trying to solve this problem at the beginning of the 20th century, which mm -hmm. is to say, what do you do with all of these instruments that had heretofore been seen as outside of Western music? and putting them with the most Western of all instruments, the pianos, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, this is, this is not something that, to, to answer that question, this is not something that has just been asked. Right. This is a question that's been asked, you know, as long as, as, long as we're thinking about percussion, this is a question mm -hmm. that's been asked. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for the questions, folks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Have you, are, where, what's, What's your current thinking about 2021, June? Just waiting on an answer from Governor Cuomo. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's looking dicey all of a sudden. It really no, is. we're going yeah. back up. We're ticking back. Yeah, up. I know. Yeah. 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 So. I, I'd say like. It's going to make a PowerPoint hoping. slide for Yarnwire. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Reopening plan. Actually, we, yeah, we would need that. I think we're hoping. Um, obviously to be able to do it in person, but it, it depends on all these factors, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. And if, if we aren't able to do it in person, I think we'll know a little bit sooner than last year, which mm -hmm. was, um, you know, very short notice. And, uh, we have some experience with an online setup now, so we'll, we'll find a way to, to, to do it. The online one last, last year, while not the same was still successful. 
um, and I think we can make it some something really special. Uh, but the goal right now is to plan for in person while having a backup. Yeah, we are. I was skeptical about the the online artist yeah. residency, and I was scheduled to to be a master artist at Atlantic Center for the Arts, and that oh, got nice. canceled. And I volunteered to run it anyway, mm -hmm. and I was really shocked that like they actually a group of people who had never met really did develop a sense of community. Yeah. Um, and I was just, I was like, oh, it's, this isn't as bad as I thought it would be. So yeah. if you're on the fence about it, um, it really, it can happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. So trust, trust the process, trust, trust the music. Absolutely. I think also, you know, it gives us a, it gave us a chance last summer to try and find media that, you know, it wasn't replacing a live event, but we made things that were, you know, specific for this mm -hmm. time. And given enough time, we can we can go way deeper, you know, with with new technologies that we're now familiar with and things like that. So, yeah. you know, there's there's a lot to be done because this is this is the world we live in right now. So we'll we'll meet it wherever it is, you know. Yeah. Yep. And I mean, I keep saying, gosh, we should just be incorporating this in everything we do in the future just for equity and access. Um, yeah. For. I am revamping an installation to work online and I'm like, Oh, a lot more people are going to be able to come to it than they could in person. And mm -hmm. I really think we need to start thinking very seriously about once things do reopen, how we make, how we keep the best parts of, yeah. of our online lives um, yeah. available. Yeah. yeah. That's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. So Ian, you're going to yeah. do the outro. Is that I will correct? do the, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I will do the outro. So, um, Thank you so much, Judy. Thanks, Matt. Thank Thanks, Matt, for being here. Um, we'll hope to introduce some new Yarnware custom Zoom background soon. Um, <laughs> the next, the next you too can have a moving cloth. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but um, for those of you listening right now, please tune in again on this Thursday, uh, October 1st. Can't believe September is already over. We'll be chatting with um, Marianthi Papa Alexandri and percussionist Ross Carr. And please remember to subscribe to our channel. Check out our page on patreon.com where you can both support this project and receive exclusive subscriber benefits. So uh, with like that- Like a custom yarn wire ringtone. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Love it. Thanks all for coming. And yeah. we'll, we'll see you soon. See you soon. Thanks, Thanks. everyone. Thank you. Um, Bye. Bye.